why Harry and Meghan's wedding gives me such hope for the monarchy. With just a small note of caution for its newest megastar member, says Robert Lacey, as Britain's newest and most dazzling duchess was taking her final non-royal steps along the Isle of St. George's Chapel yesterday, her route passed over the tomb of King George III, 1760-1820, the last king of North America. What would he have made, one wonders, of this fresh young American recruit to his centuries-old dynasty? The chapel, the trumpets the oaths and the rituals, the clip-clopping horses and the cheering crowds. On the surface, the trademarks of British monarchy have changed very little in the 250 years since Mad King George came to the throne. The pomp and circumstance, along with a veneer of royal names, titles and palaces, look largely the same, from the outside. But from the inside, things have changed profoundly. It is one of the cunning survival devices of our ever-adaptable royal family. The trick is to stay looking modern. An institution that once embodied unquestioned, sacred authority is now a matter of largely secular, democratic choice. The crown that reigns supreme now survives at the people's pleasure, and it must keep pleasing the people if it wants to stay in business. Every modern royal marriage is hailed as a moment when the nation redefines itself, updating our current vision of what's modern and what matters, and yesterday's marriage of Meghan and Harry is the latest example of that. The qualities that would once have disqualified Meghan from any respectable royal contact, let alone marriage, are now seen as brilliant new assets and priorities that make her perfect for the job. Many ancient traditions were, at one point, radical new departures. Take Queen Victoria's wedding to Prince Albert in 1840, for example. Until then, it was customary for brides to wear bright and colorful dresses that could be recycled on later occasions. But Victoria chose to wear white on the day because it highlighted the delicate lace of her gown so beautifully. And, hey presto, brides of every class and purchasing power started wearing white in imitation. The all-white bridal gown soon came to seem mandatory. Royal weddings went more public 18 years later when that queen's eldest daughter, Princess Victoria, married Frederick, the future king of Prussia and German emperor. The wedding party went out to salute the crowds from the balcony of Buckingham Palace, and the balcony scene became a staple of royal weddings thereafter, except when held at Windsor. There are battlements say plenty around Windsor Castle, but no plaza exists where the crowds can safely gather. Hence yesterday's very earliest royal post-marital kiss on record, as we all watched on television, straight after the service on the steps outside the chapel. The wedding of our present queen to the Duke of Edinburgh was semi-televised in 1947. The BBC outside broadcasting unit mounted its largest operation to date between Buckingham Palace and Westminster Abbey. But the Dean of Westminster would allow no cameras inside, so viewers had to switch on the wireless to listen to the service itself. That union, of course, was a controversial marriage to an extrovert and free-thinking foreigner, distrusted by the establishment. Sound familiar? How those courtiers muttered. But look how it turned out. The world had to wait another 13 years for the first fully televised royal wedding when Princess Margaret married Anthony Armstrong Jones in May 1960, an experience shared by 300 million viewers around the globe. But even at the start of the swinging 60s, the couple did not kiss. Cue Charles and Diana in 1981 after their return from St. Paul's Cathedral. Shall we? The lip readers in the crowd saw them mouth to each other and the custom of the balcony kiss was born. Andrew and Fergie kept the tradition enthusiastically alive in 1986, as did William and Kate in 2011. Few people realized as Harry escorted his elder brother down the aisle that day that he was the first ever best man at a royal wedding. Until then brothers and other attendant males were officially described as supporters. Dash Charles and Andrew had served as Edward's supporters at his 1999 wedding to Sophie Rhys Jones. Then the 2005 marriage, or more properly the marital blessing dash of Charles and Camilla in Windsor saw innovation of a more profound nature. Both bride and groom were divorcees, an unthinkable possibility in 1956 when group captain Peter Townsend and Princess Margaret forswore their love because the group captain was divorced, albeit not the guilty party. Yesterday's pictures of Doria Ragland, Meghan's African-American mother, escorting her daughter to the church, wrote another page of history, with Meghan choosing to walk herself alone halfway to the altar, before meeting her future father-in-law, Prince Charles, as an independent woman dash given away by nobody. This is what can happen, it seems, when an adventurous soul like Prince Harry steps outside the magic circle and marries a girl from a non-privileged background who has formed her own values from the grind of real life. But what about Meghan's painful family embarrassments of the previous days, events which at times have seemed to be drawn from the plot of a soap opera? In congratulating ourselves on our progress since 1936, when it was impossible for a divorced American woman to marry King Edward VIII, we have forgotten that the last royal couple to celebrate a marriage in St. George's Chapel, Charles and Camilla, were in fact both divorcees. The real innovation of yesterday's union was that both bride and groom were the victims of divorce, having come from broken homes, and this can serve as our starting point in trying to imagine what lies ahead.
On Harry's side, the sadness of his parents' divorce, compounded by the tragic death of Diana, has had the happy consequence of bringing him remarkably close to his elder brother. Never has the House of Windsor seen two princes who worked so warmly and intimately together. Their jointly operated charity, the Royal Foundation, is a particular example of that, taking its theme from the brothers' own experience. The Duchess of Cambridge has provided a third member of the partnership, and now, it seems, the circle will be completed by Meghan. But mention of Kate does indicate the dramatic difference in the family support systems of the new royal sisters-in-law. The striving, self-made, and above all unified Middleton clan have provided Kate with an ongoing family fallback structure which, as we have seen, the former Meghan Markle conspicuously lacks. It is interesting that she invited Prince Charles to walk her down the last part of the aisle yesterday as her father substitute. So might he possibly prove, in some way, able to develop this mentoring role further, as, in fairness, he has proved a rather better mentor to his motherless sons than his critics give him credit for? Meghan will have to be sure not to upstage Kate. The new rival is a gifted and extrovert campaigner with all the panache of her mother country, but she must not campaign too much. Kate is a future queen and is sailing majestically towards that destination. As the latest and most junior member of the new royal quartet, the glamorous soap opera star must take care to dial it back. The Sussexes' proposed role as Commonwealth ambassadors, with a special emphasis on children, would seem the ideal way to set the precedence right. The Queen can no longer visit the Commonwealth, while Charles will have other priorities if he becomes king. How lucky we are, as we step into Brexit, to have 52 countries around the world, including Canada, India, Pakistan, Australia and some of Africa's leading nations, who were happy to be counted among our friends. Long before she met Harry, and as she first realized the power that her fame as an actress gave her, Meghan flew to Africa to campaign for clean water. If a social engineer was setting out to design the perfect ambassador couple for 21st century Britain, it would surely be these two. Shared emotional intelligence was the striking feature of Harry and Meghan's interview on their engagement day last November. Confined by the paparazzi to their cottage in the grounds of Kensington Palace, they had spent their months of enforced seclusion roasting chicken and getting to know each other with an intensity that few new couples have the opportunity to enjoy. Barring misfortune, multiracial princes and princesses seem a certainty, and that in itself will make the face of the royal family more like that of the nations it represents. Monarchy is only ever as good as the people doing the job, and the British monarchy is currently, clearly, on a high. But how might it look in a few years' time with King Charles III on the throne? What if there is to be an avowed the anti-monarchist occupant of no ten? Popular moods can change suddenly, sometimes dangerously. The Fab Four will require all their resources to meet the challenge of the future, and the genial unity that was on display between them yesterday in Windsor augurs very well for that. How marvelous it is that in the British system of constitutional monarchy, pomp is kept out of the hands of the politicians, and that from time to time we do clear the front page, and a good many other pages as well, to welcome the birth of a baby, or celebrate, as we did yesterday, a young couple's declaration and commitment of their love.